Welcome back. This is the Northfield Church of Christ online worship service. My name is Michael, and it's Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. Now, I have some information for you. Beginning next Sunday, July 5th, we will be meeting here at the building for worship service for the first time since March, and I'm looking forward to it. However, if you do not feel comfortable coming back, it's okay because we're going to be streaming the services live on our YouTube channel. If we have any complications or problems with that as well, it's okay because we're also going to be recording the services and we'll place that on our YouTube channel as well, albeit perhaps a little later in the day. Now, we've taken precautions here. We have every second pew blocked off. We have hand sanitization stations throughout the building, and we have new safety protocols put into place for the Lord's Supper. So if you feel comfortable coming back, we'd love to see you. Also, I, I must mention, you have to wear a mask during services, so bring your masks along with this. Now, as far as our members go, I know Anita is still recovering at home. William's cousins, James and Peggy, are asking for prayers. Elizabeth Estevez continues to ask for prayers. Uh, the Murillo family, as you know, Tanya's father passed away, so they're asking for prayers as well. Now, if you're new and you're seeing us for the first time, please wait till after the sermon to the closing thoughts where we have more information about our congregation to share with you. Also, it's been my pleasure bringing you the announcements every week, and I certainly hope that you found these online worship services beneficial, uplifting, and inspiring. But I do wait for the day when we can meet again in this building and worship together as one. But for now, we're going to have an opening prayer to prepare our minds for the worship service ahead. Thanks for being here. Good morning, church. As we prepare our minds for worship service, I'd like to remind everyone, even though we're not meeting, I'd like to remind you that every third Sunday, in our PM service, we do our Barnabas News. So I'd just like to remind everyone to reach out to our members with maybe a phone call, a text, or just some words of encouragement to let them know that you're thinking of them. Will you go with me to our Heavenly Father and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you on this first day of the week, dear kind Father. Just giving thanks for this day, dear kind Father. It's an honor to be in your presence this morning, dear kind Father. I just pray that as we go into this morning's worship service, dear kind Father, everything is done will be pleasing and acceptable unto thee, dear kind Father. I humbly ask these prayers in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Our hymn before the Lord's Supper will be, Let Me Be a Sacrifice, and that's number 246 of the hymn, uh, hymn book at home. Again, the title is Let Me Be a Sacrifice, number 246, and we're going to sing it through twice. And from the reading, Romans 12:1. It says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Let me be a sacrifice. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, consumed in your praise. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, worshiping your name. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, consumed in your praise. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, worshiping your name. Good morning. 
The Lord's Supper connects us with the cross, and the early church assembled every Lord's Day, as indicated in Acts 2.42 and Acts 27. 1 Corinthians 16.1, Hebrews 10.25, Revelation 2.10. The Lord's Supper was placed in an assembly, and the Christian does not partake alone and then assemble. The church is saved because the church has a Savior. The church is saved because Jesus Christ is the host, not the guest. And the Lord's Supper is not a church sacrament that forgives us. It's a memorial declaring. That we are forgiven. Jesus has only one command, and that's follow me. He only has one request, remember me. As indicated in Matthew 26, 26 to 29, and 1 Corinthians 10, 16. One Bible, one bread, one cup, one body, one blood, and one covenant. The Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. Every member can participate. The focus is on the Word, the cross, and the table. Members examine themselves. Members proclaim the Lord's death until He comes in 1 Corinthians 11.26. This is why we take the Lord's Supper to those who are unable to leave their homes. They too are a part of the body, and the Lord's Supper is a celebration. It is not a funeral. It is one memorial around which the church rallies. In Matthew's account of the Last Supper, one incredible truth surfaces. Jesus is the person behind it all. He selected the place, designated the time, and set the meal in order. And at the supper, Jesus is not served, but a servant. It is Jesus who put on the garb of a, per of a servant and washed the disciples' feet. It is Jesus. Jesus is not portrayed as one who reclines and receives, but as one who stands and gives. And he still does today. The Lord's Supper is a gift to you. The Lord's Supper is a holy invitation, a sacrament binding you to leave the chores of life and enter his splendor. He meets you every Sunday at the table. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this wonderful time we have to celebrate the life of Jesus, for his life, his death, and most importantly, for his resurrection. We thank you, Father, for the emblem that we have to remember and as we gather around the table to celebrate his life and celebrate the life that he gives you beyond this world. We thank you for this event. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this emblem. And we are just thankful, people, for all you have done, for the ability to one day be with you in eternity. We ask you to bless the emblem and bless all who partake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus alone prayed to God, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Though we often emphasize his moment of doubt that night, many times we don't look at the unfailing conviction, as God wills. Though the coming crucifixion was crucial to our redemption and the sacrifice he was to make for us, it was God's will that was supreme. Thus, when Jesus passed the cup to his apostles to drink in remembrance of him, it was to remember the supremacy of God's will. This was his blood to be spilled for our redemption, but most importantly, this was God's will to grace us with eternal salvation. Let us remember this as we drink of the cup. Let us pray. 
Dear Lord, as we partake of this cup, which represents the blood you spilled for us, let us remember the grace of God's will to redeem us from our sins, to redeem us from this imperfect world, to watch us, wash us free of our transgressions, and to purify us with your love. Let us be knowledgeable of our sins so we may purge them. Let us be joined together in your blood, which runs through us all equally, so we may come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and live this earthly life a little closer to that which you desire we live. We know you hold all power of will, and it is only through your grace that we are made holy. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Separate and aside from the Lord's Supper, we are also commanded to give back as we have prospered. Will you bow with me as we give thanks for the collection? Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you this morning just giving thanks for this collection that will be taken, dear kind Father. For it is just a small portion that we give back to you compared to what you have given to us, dear kind Father. I pray that as we collect these funds, dear kind Father, that it will be used in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. I also pray that the portion of this service was done in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto you. I ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The hymn before the lesson will be 417 in our hymn books, and the title is Where He Leads, I'll Follow. And that's 417 in our hymn books, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. And after this hymn, we'll have a scripture reading before the lesson. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see, he the great example is in pattern for me. Where he leads a follow, follow. Jesus hath shown, sweeter far than any love that mortals have known. Kind to the erring one, faithful is he. He the great example is and pattern for me. Where he leads all follow, follow all the way. Where he leads all follow. Follow Jesus every day. Listen to his loving words, come unto me. Weary, heavy laden, there is sweet rest for thee. Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior and thy soul is secure. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The second one is from John 8, 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And the third one is from Luke 24, 27, and then 44, 47. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets of the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding, 
that they might comprehend his scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached into his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Good morning. This is Mark Sign. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and I will be delivering the message this morning. In case you're wondering about my tie, yes, these are our grandchildren, Mark and Athena. Um, pretty proud of them. And a pretty nifty Father's Day present last week, wouldn't you say? I digress. Uh, let's get on with this morning's lesson. For the past six weeks, we have been studying uh, a series of lessons entitled Jesus the Way. And in this series, I have attempted to present Jesus as the way to many blessings. Indeed, he is the source of every spiritual blessing that we have and um, every spiritual blessing that God actually has to offer to us. But a, a question might arise as we complete this series of lessons, and that question might be, how can we be sure that we have found the true Jesus and that we are true disciples? Jesus made it very, very clear that simply Believing in him does not necessarily constitute true discipleship. In uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, uh, Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And Jesus, in John chapter 8, verse 31, uh, said, Then Jesus said to those Jews, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. And so we want to make sure that we are approaching and we are following and have truly found Jesus. Jesus, the way. And we must begin with the only only reliable source of information that we have about him, and that is the Bible. And so surprising as it may seem, let's start um, in our Bible in the Old Testament. And the first item that we are going to talk about today is finding Jesus the way in the Old Testament. First, let's use Jesus' own words, because very often Jesus quoted words from the Old Testament to get his point across to us. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, he said, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Later, to the apostles themselves, he wrote in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 47, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, and all the things that must be fulfilled that were in the law of Moses. And he went on to say, It is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead on the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, how can all of this be? How can, from the Old Testament, we see Jesus as we see them, as we see him? Well, I would convey to you that we see him, uh, we see Jesus 
through the eyes of prophecy. And so B, under finding Jesus in the Old Testament, is finding him in the prophets, especially Isaiah. For example, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we find out about the birth of Jesus some six to seven hundred years before it happened. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And if we slip down to chapter 53, we learn about the suffering of Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And he goes on to say, we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned every way to his own way. And the Lord has laid our iniquity on him. And finally, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, we see the sovereignty of Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You know those beautiful words, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Now, you know what? We can take prophecy after prophecy out of the book of Isaiah and out of other prophets, and many of them would say the same thing about Jesus. It would uh, it's estimated that there are in the neighborhood of 330 different prophecies about Jesus that come through the prophets. So, in order to find the way to Jesus, it's necessary for us to go to the Old Testament, to start at the beginning. But as important as that is in helping us to find Jesus, its purpose was predictive. It was to prepare people for Jesus' coming. Therefore, to find Jesus more fully, let's find him through the Gospels. And this is part two of our lesson this morning, finding Jesus in the Gospels. A, from all four Gospels. Now, I hate to kind of pigeonhole the four Gospels, but I'm, I'm going to give you each of the Gospels kind of in a nutshell. For example, Matthew emphasizes the teachings of Jesus, especially in regard to the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, Mark features the miracles of Jesus, which he did to show and prove his power. Luke underscores the humanity of Jesus without detracting from his divinity. And then we find the Gospel of John that actually, <coughs> excuse me, expresses the divinity of Jesus with, uh, without detracting from his humanity. And so as we read the Gospels, we see that they have one special purpose, and that is to create faith, as expressed by Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Here Jesus said, uh, here John says, and truly Jesus did other signs and miracles uh, in the presence of his disciples, that are not recorded here. But those that are were recorded so you would believe, so you would believe that this man was this great and powerful man, Jesus Christ. And so the Gospels help us to see Jesus through the eyes of the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament. And they also reveal the things that Jesus actually taught. No one can know Jesus without reading the Gospels. And when we do, we're often surprised to find out how different the real Jesus is and what he actually taught. Then 
from what is imagined by many, many people. For example, many people believe that simply because they believe, they're going to heaven. It's, you know, I believe I'm going to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus puts out this warning. Enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are few who find the narrow way. That's a warning. Among those who will be surprised will be those who thought they really knew Jesus. And to that end, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, I'm going to coin my own word here, as silly as it might be. Contrary to simple, here it is, believism, I don't think there's such a word, that many think is involved in following Jesus. By reading the Gospels, we find out what the real Jesus said about himself. And in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25, we find these very salient terms. If anyone desires to come after him, after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will save it for my sake. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses and his spiritual life is destroyed? There is one gospel that even ends with a challenge by Jesus to his disciples and to you and I. You may have guessed it's the gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus says to his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And so what you're supposed to do, it says, go therefore to all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as I have commanded you. And so Jesus left his disciples in charge to observe all Things. And interestingly enough, at this point in time, the disciples thought they were pretty smart, but didn't really understand all the things that Jesus said. And so Jesus was constrained in John 16, verses 12 to 14, to say, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. They just weren't ready. And so that brings us to part three of our lesson, and that is finding Jesus through finding Jesus through the book of Acts and through the epistles. First of all, let's see if we can find Jesus through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the fulfillment of what Jesus said, that the Spirit would uh, come down and the Spirit would, would um, he would send that spirit to them. And uh, that spirit, uh, that powerful spirit, would guide them in all ways. So in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Goodness gracious. Can you imagine how amazing that must have been for the disciples? And now we start to call the disciples apostles. As one reads the book of Acts, we can see the workings of the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles and the early church in its formative stage. Slowly but surely, the Holy Spirit guides them into the truth. And it even reveals to them some of the things that Jesus taught them that a few years ago, even a few months ago, they did not understand. And so in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, 
to the elders at the church of Ephesus, he said, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember, listen to this, remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it's more blessed to give than receive. That wonderful term that we use. We especially use it uh, at the giving part of our service. These are Jesus' words. And guess what? The apostles got it now through the Holy Spirit. And it was because the Holy Spirit was guiding the apostles into all the truth that we come up with a second aspect of finding Jesus, not just in the Acts, but in the epistles. For example, the apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of God. Now, you know, in the beginning, the churches were reading Old Testament. That's all they had. That wasn't good enough for Paul. That wasn't good enough for the Holy Spirit inspired Paul. He knew that they needed more. He knew, he knew that they needed Holy Spirit inspired words. And so he wrote letters to these churches. And these letters were read in the company of the church. And these letters were for the purpose of guiding the first century church. So to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, he writes, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as the word of truth. The Thessalonians realized that the letters and the words that the Apostle Paul spoke were true Holy Spirit-driven words. And these words, these epistles, would become the bedrock of the New Testament church as Paul and James and John and Peter all wrote epistles. Holy Spirit inspired epistles. And, you know, uh, of course, Jesus himself had said that those, and this was predictive, who received his apostles would be receiving him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me. It was kind of like Jesus saying to his disciples years before, if you want to get to God, you need to understand me. You want to see God, you need to see me. Now, there's an important aspect here that we need to see. And that is that the Holy Spirit did, in fact, guide the apostles into all truth. In other words, with the Gospels, with the book of Acts, with the epistles, including the book of Revelation, we find the teachings of Jesus completely, fully, and finally. Guess what? We don't need any more. We've got it all. We've got the Gospels. We have got, uh, obviously, the Old Testament, the, the prophecies. We've got the Book of Acts and the Epistles. And so it, it, it uh, causes Peter to, to write these words in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his virtue. And so the Apostle Paul also talked about that completeness when he wrote to Timothy and he told Timothy about Scripture. His letters to Timothy became, um, became 
living epistles that guided the church. And he said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you've heard this before, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And finally, uh, his teachings were to be considered and uh, in such a way that notice what Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 1, 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Paul let him know, it's my Holy Spirit inspired words that are the real ones. And so, with the writing of the New Testament, we're able to see Jesus through the eyes of completeness. All we need to know to follow Jesus the way is, us, is for us to do two things, to learn it and to live it. No other revelations are needed. Our task is to completely remain true to the word of God. Jude actually wrote this, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And so the final part of our lesson, and running into the conclusion, part four, is finding Jesus in obedience. Remember, Jesus had said, if you love me, Obey me. If you love me, believe my commandments. And John chapter 14, verse 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. And notice a couple of verses later in verse 23. He says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that great? That Jesus and God will make their home with us if we just obey. When we keep the commandments of Jesus and his Father, we will truly have found Jesus the way. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, John writes, Now by this time we know that if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep the commandments is a liar. And so we have to keep those commandments. And by keeping them, we come to know and to experience the true Jesus we actually find Jesus the way. This is especially true when we ultimately come to Jesus in faith, repentance, and confession to his command to be baptized. Remember, it's how he ended the Gospel of Matthew, to go into all the world and preach the word, baptizing them into the name of Jesus Christ. Having received or put on Christ in baptism, we are now in Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. And so as we conclude, as, as we have looked at Jesus the way, we have started by saying that Jesus is the way to a better life, that Jesus is the way to forgiveness of sins, that Jesus is the way for us to have reconciliation with the Father, that Jesus is the way to be within his true church, that Jesus shows us the assurance of eternal life. And so we want to make sure that we found Jesus the way, not some cheap imitation, which at best is a misconception fostered by honestly mistaken people. Having found Jesus, we are to take his great commission seriously. That we are to go and preach the word to all the world. 
Finally, those who have truly found Jesus the way accept the authority or power that he has on heaven and earth. Those that have truly found Jesus are those that have been baptized upon faith and repentance as he commanded. And finally, those who have truly found Jesus are careful to observe all things that he has commanded and live a godly life up until we take our last breath. I pray that you will let Jesus be your way to everything that is truly good, to trust him and obey him in his own words, to deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow him. And as Peter said in that sermon on the day of Pentecost, he, he told the people, why do you tarry? Rise and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you haven't taken that to heart, if you, if you know that you need this to start your Christian walk, we are available to you. We want to help you to start your Christian life so you can truly find Jesus the way. I pray that you will be well that you will be healthy. We look forward to the day that we can meet together. Uh, we look forward ultimately to the day that we meet together with the Lord. May God bless you all. Thank you so much. Our closing hymn this morning will be from our hymn books, number 731. That's 731 in our hymn books. The title is Take Time to Be Holy. And from 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, it says, Be holy in all you do. Take time to be holy. <clears throat> Take time to be holy. Speak up with thy Lord. Abide in him always. And feed on his word. May Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, dear kind Father, just giving thanks for this first day of the week, dear kind Father, in which we gather together to worship you in the spirit and in truth, dear kind Father. I just pray that this morning's worship service, dear kind Father, was pleasing and acceptable to you. 
And I just pray that as we go out through the rest of this week, dear kind Father, the message that was heard, that we just take to heart, dear kind Father. Just be with us until the next time that we assemble together and just keep your loving arms wrapped around us. I humbly ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ, and let the church say amen. Amen. Welcome back. And I certainly hope you found this lesson uplifting and inspiring as much as I have. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're new and you'd like to find out more about us, please visit our website at www.northfieldchurchofchrist.com. You'll find lots of information about us, including an email or a phone call if you prefer contacting us that way. Or you can visit our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Northfield Church of Christ, where we have a daily devotional. Also, members, don't forget our online contribution platforms of Venmo and PayPal. You'll find those on our website as well. Now, if you are uh, a member and you haven't subscribed yet, there's a little red box right over here. If you hit or click subscribe, that'll help us uh, gain notoriety on the YouTube channel and their logarithms. So that helps a lot. Again, I want to thank you for joining us during these tough and difficult times. We hope that you found our services uplifting and inspiring. We hope to see you here at one of our church meetings on Sunday morning. Thanks again. Stay safe. Have a great week. Holy words are preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's heart. Oh, let the ancient world.